<laughs> Ella. Yeah, Miss Zoom <laughs> greeted us. So uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, good morning to our guest speakers. Um, Dr. Ivana Damianovic and Professor Nicolas Desta Sadele. Sorry for my pronunciation in advance. I'm Valeria Graziano, and I'm just going to uh, welcome you to this virtual space of the uh, Center for Advanced Studies, University of Rijeka, Rijeka for this um, guest lecture today uh, that is titled The Rule of Law and EU Funds, Legal and Political Perspectives. Uh, we'll hear uh, more in a minute about the content, but just about some house rules. As usual, I will ask everyone to keep their microphones uh, muted. We will have um, the chance to uh, ask questions and uh, also offer feedback at the end of the presentation uh, later on. Uh, this session is also recorded, so I hope everyone is aware of that and comfortable with uh, being uh, part of the video that will be placed online on the YouTube channel of the Centre. Um, so, hello Ivana, uh, I would, uh, it is my pleasure to introduce you uh, from Canberra, very, very far away from most, where most of us are located at the moment. So Dr. Damianovic is a lecturer at the Canberra Law School and a visiting research fellow at the Centre for European Studies of the Australian National University. She's an interdisciplinary researcher who holds qualifications in law, economics, and international relations, and has qualified as a lawyer in, the, in Australia and Croatia. She has gained academic experience as a lecturer in Australia and Asia, teaching in undergraduate and postgraduate law and business programs as a guest lecturer in Europe. Ivana has also worked in a range of roles, uh, including as a diplomat for the former uh, government of Croatia, uh, and as a legal consultant and trade advisor for the delegation of the European Union to Australia. She has published on international investment and trade law and EU external trade relations. Her first monograph on the EU's reform of international investment law will be published with Cambridge University Press in 2023. Um, so we really look forward to that. Um, yeah, so to you, Ivana. Uh, thank you very much, Valeria, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Welcome uh, to everyone. Uh, greetings from Canberra, from um, rainy Canberra, I must say. Uh, it's uh, already evening here. Um, and uh, thank you very much for invitation to participate um, in this uh, seminar. It is great to meet you. and. Uh, it is great pleasure to um, give this lecture together with my uh, co-presenter, uh, Professor Nicola de Sadler, who is a, a colleague with whom I cooperate a lot. Um, he is an expert on EU law, um, in particular comparative and environmental law. And uh, we've been doing a lot of work in the sphere of trade and investment, so intersections between trade uh, and investment. Um, a little bit about Nicola, he is a professor at the uh, University of St. Louis in Brussels. Uh, he is the Jean Monnet Chair on a right to a clean environment. And he also previously held uh, another Jean Monnet uh, Chair on trade um, and environment. And he was also a Marie Curie uh, Chair at the University of uh, Oslo. Uh, we actually met in Canberra, so Nicholas was also a distinguished uh, international legal scholar at uh, my university, at the University of Canberra, uh, where he visited in 2017. And he's been a guest lecturer at uh, other Australian universities, but also other universities uh, across the world. Um, in, uh, in Asia, in Africa, uh, Latin America, uh, North America as well. So um, he's fluent in, in English, French, Spanish, um, Dutch, Norwegian. So, um, and he's been cooperating with, uh, with many universities. So um, also Nicholas is the author of 
is it 13 books, Nicolas, I think? I don't count, <laughs> I have no <not> tell <laughs> And uh, he has published widely on um, EU environmental law. I think, uh, yeah, your book on environmental principles, uh, which was published uh, in 2001 is one of the core uh, readings in the area of uh, environmental law. But today we are going to actually talk about um, the rule of law. And in particular, we will focus on um, the uh, EU funds and um, the, the new regulation uh, regarding the conditionality mechanism regarding uh, EU funds and the rule of law. So I'll share some slides with you and um, the way we have organized ourselves is to um, we will share the presentation so I will um, speak in the first part and then um, Nicholas will take over and just okay here it is it works um, so um, I will start with the outline of what is the rule of law? So concept that we have, uh, we all know very well, but it's always good to go back to some of the core principles uh, in relation to the rule of law. And then um, from there, we will move to the um, concept of the rule of law in particular uh, in the EU, and then look more, um, uh, more specifically um, uh, to the concept of the rule of law in relation to to the budget, EU budget. So, um, of course, when we talk about the rule of law here, we're going to take a, a, a legal perspective on the rule of law because um, the concept has um, different meanings uh, also in different disciplines. So what we will try to do is just provide some, some um, uh, legal perspectives um, uh, on how is it seen. And we can later discuss to what extent uh, these perspectives are different. Um, so when we talk about the rule of law, actually the core idea uh, uh, around the rule of law is to have the set of rules which will create a stable society. So the idea is that society is ruled through law, not through um, arbitrary decision-making making by um, people uh, or rulers. Um, so um, if we have to say, I always talk to my students about this, if you have to um, emphasize what is the core of the rule of law, it's really about limitations uh, on the government imposed by law. Um, so uh, in order to uh, avoid arbitrary use of power. And when we talk about the rule of law, we can we also talk about liberalism and the rights. So we can say that the, the, that liberalism and the rule of law are the um, two sides of the same coin. So liberalism as um, uh, the idea, the philosophy of law um, uh, seeks to protect liberties and rights of citizens and promote autonomy of citizens. So um, basically explain when those um, limitations should be put on the government when the government should not interfere with the lives of citizens. On the other hand, um, the rule of law focuses more on the activities of the government. So um, basically, how do we limit the government so that we avoid arbitrary interventions and um, uh, so that uh, and in, in that sense also ensure stronger, stronger civil uh, liberties. So um, some of the core aspects of the rule of law are of course constitutionality. So the idea that um, the rule of law is not simply government through laws, but also the government under laws. So um, the idea that um, there, there have to be a certain set of rules um, uh, on how laws are made. So we look at the constitution as the basic um, document, as a basic, uh, as superior rules, uh, which are uh, above the political arena through which um, uh, the um, 
process for rulemaking is established and which importantly creates separation of powers. So, and that separation of powers serves to avoid concentration of power. And of course, what uh, becomes particularly important in this uh, picture is independent judiciary um, so that uh, judicial uh, arm of the government is um, fully separated um, from the executive and um, and hence can actually exercise control over the executive. Then the other aspect of formal legality, basically um, what characteristics laws should have in order to comply with the rule of law. So the idea that um, laws should be expression of equality, so they should apply to everyone um, equally and in cases where this is where there are exceptions, there have to be um, valid justification why there are exceptions from those general rules. Another important aspect is that rules have to be uh, public, so uh, that everyone knows what the rules are, so that they know how, so that people know how they have to behave. Um, they have to be clear um, and also specific in a way that they provide. Um, precise guidance to the uh, executive so um, that there is not too much discretion left in terms of laws and um, then um, that uh, actually um, uh, those specific um, provisions can be then properly uh, in implemented. Um, they also have to be prospective, so look look into the future um, in order to uh, ensure compliance. Um, they have to be doable in a way that um, we cannot accept uh, expect um, uh, things from people that they they wouldn't be able to comply with. And very important, um, there has to be some uh, sort of stability so that people can. Uh, plan uh, their lives so that we don't have sudden and often changes of laws uh, because that brings uncertainty. So the whole idea of, of uh, these formal characteristics of law is to actually have um, legal certainty. And then uh, finally, the aspect of procedural legality. So very important to have um, proper procedures in terms of how laws are made how they're executed and then interpreted and uh, enforced. So here in that in this aspect, in particular, uh, we're talking about uh, ensuring um, a due process uh, when we talk about courts. So we, we mentioned already importance of independence of courts guaranteed in the constitution um, to, for example, the appointment of judges, but also then, um, the idea that uh, that due process, natural justice is guaranteed through um, through public scrutiny, so that the courts are public, anyone can come to courts and observe what is happening in the court, uh, and uh, see how courts make those decisions. That decisions and reasoning uh, are public, and that of course um, all sides in the proceedings have that opportunity to be heard to present their side of the story um, and that the decision make makers are disinterested in a way that they don't have uh, some kind of personal interest in in, in a cer in certain outcome in the in the proceedings. So basically when we talk about the rule of law um, for lawyers the um, the the emphasis in, is placed on the approach, which is a formal approach. So the focus is really on the method, not as much as substance, but the idea is if this method is, is properly implemented, we would eventually um, reach, um, reach just outcomes um, in the society. This is not, of course, uh, always the case, uh, but um, that is the idea behind the legal um, formalism. So if I can just summarize it, um, the, the three elements, so the element of constitutionality, um, so how government uh, should rule and be ruled, so importance of checks and balances, and in particular, the independent judiciary, 
then uh, also elements of formal legality. What, uh, what are those formal characteristics that law should have? Um, and procedural legality, so procedure under which laws are basically implemented, put into operation with due process and um, independent and unbiased courts as core elements. All right, now Nicholas will tell us now, how does this apply in the context of the EU? Yes, I'm, I'm just um, holding my speech from a hotel room in uh, southwestern France, Toulouse. Um, so I'm not in the uh, uh, best conditions. Uh, I would like to emphasize uh, three key dimensions um, underscored by my colleague. Uh, firstly, regarding constitutionality, uh, I shall um, come back to the issue of separation of powers in the uh, assessment and control, as well as surveillance of sound financial management of uh, EU funds being uh, disbursed. And in particular, I shall emphasize the role of the court of auditors, which is of importance in particular for uh, political scientists, uh, as well as the uh, body in charge at EU level of the anti-fraud, the OLAF. Uh, second, regarding uh, formal legality, I shall uh, shed light on the principle of legal certainty that has been invoked by both Hungary and Poland while challenging the uh, conditionality, uh, budgetary condi uh, conditionality regulation. And uh, that argument has been dismissed by the Court of Justice of the EU, and I will explain the reasoning endorsed by the Court of Justice. Thirdly, even I mentioned also procedural uh, legality, uh, mentioning the due process before court, uh, it occurs to me that the due process occurs also at administrative level uh, in the process of uh, measures, uh, proposed measures uh, um, aimed at sanctioning a member state that does not apply correctly the principles stemming from the rule of law and uh, the regulation uh, I shall comment on uh, provides for due process in allowing a member state such as um, Hungary uh, to uh, counter argue with the European Commission, which is in charge of triggering uh, the, the process of sanctioning uh, a member state uh, that is breaching the principles of a rule of law and that jeopardize the sound uh, financial management of EU funds. Uh, so uh, what m m matters, um, and I, I will try to, to not to be too legalistic because uh, it seems to me that most of you are political science, uh, science, scientists, uh, researchers and professors. So uh, what, what matters in a legal system is not only the uh, um, I would say uh, procedural and substantive rules. Uh, a, a legal system is more than this because a legal system, a legal order is permeated, is underpinned by key values, uh, in particular in our democratic societies. And um, by a stroke of genius, uh, the masters of the treaties, the member states, uh, in the course of the different reforms, have been listing a number of values which are um, shared by the member states and shared by the union. So uh, these different values are a common heritage of the Europeans because we do believe in democracy. We do believe in human rights. We do uh, protect, uh, to some extent, uh, minorities. We uh, do apply the rule of law as a key value in order to avoid the abuse of powers, as my colleagues just stressed. These values are entrenched, are embedded in an Article 2 of the Treaty of the European Union. And um, this is, uh, in the course of my lectures on institutional uh, European law, I really stress the legal importance of these values, but I would like also to underscore the political importance because we are facing a common heritage that distinguishes us from uh, Sudan, from Myanmar. So th these values are, are, are legal effects, and to, to have legal effects, one has to understand that there is need to be, uh, the, the breach needs to be sanctioned. You have no rules when there is no sanction. So uh, look at driving policy in your country. 
uh, it's correctly implemented, provided that there are sanctions and that um, a driver uh, driving too fast or a, dri a driving drunk is likely to be uh, uh, prosecuted uh, before a Croatian uh, criminal court. And by the same token, the master of the treaties have been providing a procedure for the breach of, va of, the, of these values, among which um, stands the rule of law under an Article 7. Next slide, please. And so our Article 7 is a rather complicated uh, process. Uh, I call it the atomic bomb procedure. So you know, the, 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 the atomic bomb uh, has always been in the, the history, um, in the recent history, a deterrent or a threat, uh, now by Mr. Putin, uh, in order to, to, uh, to prevent uh, an invasion or to prevent uh, a, a, a war. And so Article 7, in brief, um, allows the European Commission, the um, uh, one third of the member states, um, the uh, European Parliament to trigger a procedure challenging another member state, as Poland or as Hungary, that is likely to breach the, the a value such as the rule of law. And so that, that procedure has already been triggered by the European Commission and by the uh, Parliament. And so um, there are different stages. Uh, the first stage is the, the, the European Council in Brussels, so the, the, the gathering of the big boss, the, the, the chief of state and chief of governments, they have to decide by unanimity whether there is a risk. In case there is a risk, uh, there is a second step in the procedure uh, allowing the Council of Ministers, not the chief of state, but the minister, to suspend the voting rights in the Council of Ministers of the state that has been breaching um, uh, the rule of law. Uh, so far, the, this, the, this procedure has been triggered, but to no avail, uh, because um, the states don't want to blame too much Hungary or to blame too, too much uh, Poland. So uh, the, the European Parliament, uh, from a political point of view, is extremely frustrated uh, because it has been launching the procedure against Hungary, but to no avail. And um, and um, in, 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 in particular, um, um, that led to a lot of frustration among MPs uh, in Brussels, in, in Strasbourg. So the, the question is, um, what's the, the rule of law? Uh, because the concept, the value is not undefined under tr the treaty. Uh, so that, that's of important. I will come back to this, and uh, my co colleague is going to comment upon that. So, and that's typical of a of a treaty that uh, that is akin to a constitution. The constitution, look at your own constitution, is rather vague, uh, is rather concise, and therefore uh, the definitions uh, must be laid on by the court, which has been the case of the. Um, court of Justice in Luxembourg, but also by the European Court of Human Rights that has been deciding a number of cases on, on independence and impartiality. These two concepts mentioned by Ivana a few minutes ago, independence and impartiality. And so that's, in addition to this, the Venice Commission of the Council of Europe uh, has been defining the rule of law in providing a non-exhaustive list of subset of principles. So one understand uh, that the, this value shared by 27 states um, uh, is uh, actually, um, uh, how do you say, uh, fed by a, a, a pluralistic uh, approach from the Council of Europe, from the National Constitutional Court, from the European Commission, from the EU lawmaker, and from the Court of Justice. So there are, there are manifold sources that feeding uh, a, a global value that's indispensable uh, to defend the hard core of democracy. Next slide, please. So these principles are not found in the treaty, but they are found in the um, uh, regulation on conditionality uh, regarding the protection of the budget. And the EU lawmaker has been uh, kind of copy and paste as a bad students, uh, the work done by the others in stressing uh, legality that was mentioned uh, by Ivana uh, as a, a, formal, uh, a formal approach to the rule of law, separation of powers, mentioned as a constitutional approach to the rule of law, um, independent and impartial courts, 
it's related to separation of powers. Uh, effective judicial review also related to separation of powers. Uh, equality before the law, uh, that's related to procedural legality. Um, so for, for the very first time in the uh, history of Europe, the EU lawmaker, the Council of Ministers, and the European Parliament have been uh, fleshing out the various sub principles that were determined by the Venice Commission of the Council of Europe that has been uh, put forward by different uh, courts in a single in a single definition that's embedded in the conditionality uh, budgetary regulation. And that, that's really of importance uh, because as political scientists, one has to be aware uh, that the legal process of producing norms is, is, is a rather complex process at European level where you have different uh, intermingling uh, sources. So that's the, the, the procedure I just mentioned, uh, um, indicating that uh, the procedure can be easily triggered in order to demonstrate, and the words, the terms are important, a clear risk of serious breach. So the, 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 the breach is, doesn't exist yet, but uh, one is afraid uh, that the, the risk might occur, but that risk must be of a serious nature. And that procedure has been uh, triggered twice, uh, but with no results uh, so far. And so the council deciding uh, at majority of four fifths uh, must decide, must determine whether that risk exists. And so far, uh, many ministers uh, are deterring, uh, afraid to blame. They prefer uh, a diplomatic approach in order to um, goad the Hungarian authorities and Polish authorities into a better implementation of the different EU funds. Next slide, please. So that's a proposal of uh, the Council decision regarding Poland. Uh, that's still at stage number one. Next, please. And things change uh, in, uh, on the 14th of July 2020, when the, uh, in the aftermath of the, of the, the first wave of, of the pandemic in Europe, the, 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 the big boss um, uh, gathering in Brussels uh, in the uh, European Council uh, decided uh, after five days of um, hard negotiation to allow the European Commission to borrow on the market uh, thanks to AAA plus notation, uh, 750 billion euros that were that is to be distributed among the 27 member states in accordance to the needs, the socioeconomic needs determined by the impact of the COV2 um, virus. And so uh, that was really, uh, we wrote Ivana and myself about the, that regulation, that was a stroke of genius to borrow cheap money on the international market uh, by the commission who is really well rated at international level, uh, not unlike Greece or unlike uh, Cyprus, and to distribute these funds according to a principle of solidarity. Given that the Italians have been seriously impacted, economically speaking, and also socially speaking, Italians need to um, uh, be a recipient of a greater uh, share of the budget than the Germans, uh, where the impact of the COVID has been far less important. And so um, uh, many states, like um, we, we call them in French les, les frigos, uh, frugals, I, I don't know the, the English translation, um, uh, such as the, the Danish, the, the Dutch, um, um, the Germans, um, all these people were deemed to be a bit greedy. So, okay, we, we are not going to, um, uh, to, to distribute the money so quickly. We, we, we need to be um, reassured that the money is going to be distributed properly um, and uh, for that reason, there must be an additional mechanism with a view to sanctioning the states that are breaching uh, the independence of justice, that are breaching uh, the independence of the anti-fraud uh, offices, that are um, uh, making a mockery uh, of the civil servants in charge of the control of the distribution of the funds 
um, which are not taking uh, seriously uh, public procurement rules and so on and so forth. So, so you, you see that when you are ready to, um, um, to lend money to someone, provide that there is a conditionality, provide that the recipient of you, um, the money you are going to lend, uh, will use um, seriously the money to undertake his studies and not to uh, finish at two o'clock in the morning in a bar completely drunk, if you allow me the metaphor. Next slide, please. Um, so um, for that reason, um, the EU lawmaker, so that was the site at the level of uh, in Brussels by the chief of state at the government after five days negotiation, they reach a conclusion. And then uh, the EU lawmaker uh, under the treaty of the functioning of the European Union uh, adopted a specific regulation. It's a rather concise regulation on the uh, seven or nine uh, articles um, uh, that uh, provides for uh, such a mechanism um, and that determines what are the potential breaches flow. And here um, uh, I've been listing, we've been listing some of the breaches, potential breach, the, the fact of endangering the independence of the courts, um, uh, the fact of uh, limiting the uh, legal remedies. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and in case, the European Commission finds out that uh, these breaches uh, are seriously enough and that they are likely to uh, impact the sound financial management of the union budget or of the financial interest of the union. It will notify to the member state concern uh, the, the facts and the member states, and that's the due diligence process uh, I just uh, even I mentioned, and I, uh, that's I recalled, uh, the member state can uh, put forward its explanation and say, okay, uh, you accuse us of not applying correctly public procurement directives, uh, you are bloody wrong, we do apply them correctly. And I put forward that report explaining the manner in which we've been applying a procur public procurement. And in case the European Commission is not satisfied by the answer uh, of the member states, the commission can uh, um, trigger the procedure and the commission propose, uh, the council of ministers must decide. And so the decision maker is the council of ministers. So um, I, I come back to this. So the, uh, the council will take the final decision on the proposal made by Brussels, by the European commission based in Brussels. And um, that's where uh, institutional laws come uh, to the fore. Uh, the Council of Ministers cannot decide by unanimity because unanimity, just forget it, there won't be any decision, but they can decide in applying the qualified majority. Qualified majority means that 55% of the member states support the proposed measure and that these 55% of the member states so uh, represent more than 65% of the population. So you need to have the big states such as Italy, Germany, and France uh, in the group in order. Um, what's of importance is that in case the council or the majority of the members of the council say, okay, yes, the, the measures uh, proposed by the commissions against Hungary are sound, but we would like to, 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 to bring a number of modifications against the wishes of the European Commission. There, it's another procedure that applies. The council must decide by unanimity, which makes the decision much more complicated. Uh, so, uh, of course, the measure proposed by the European Commission, and the, I will come to back to the uh, what has been proposed uh, lately, uh, must take into account the principle of proportionality. So one cannot break a butterfly uh, on, on a wheel. Um, or, um, and then uh, the commission must determine the seriousness of the measure, the time lapse, uh, the duration, uh, the uh, reversibility, the recurrence of the measure, the intention of the authorities um, breaching uh, the principle of the rules. And of course, uh, we, come, we come back to the due process, the degree of cooperation. It's a bit like the students who has been cheating in the course of your exam, 
he realized that he has been bloody wrong and is really cooperating and uh, the jury is not out. The jury is likely to be keener to the students. The students are saying that uh, he has not been cheating whatsoever, is likely to be out of the university. So it's um, uh, to summarize the issue. So the principle of proportionality will, will apply. Of course, and I come back to the separation of powers. Um, we have the court of auditors, and I really, uh, as political scientists, uh, you should definitely pay heed to the reports published by the court of uh, auditors because they are really of importance because they, they, they shifted from a kind of budgetary traditional analysis 30 years ago into a much more policy analysis. So you can extract a number of uh, uh, policy elements uh, for your studies. And um, the, I was taking part in a meeting with the uh, DG Agriculture two days ago, and I can tell you that the Director General of one of the biggest departments of the European Commission in Brussels is seriously annoyed by the reports of issued by the um, uh, by the, the court of auditors. So it's a check and balance system. The same, the OLAF anti-fraud office based in Brussels conduct the investigations uh, within the European Commission to detect whether there is fraud or not. But it's also checking the manner in which the national departments are distributing the funds. So um, there is a principle of royal cooperation. The, the national departments must explain uh, to the OLAF, the ways in which they uh, control, they survey, they detect uh, possibility of fraud, of tax evasion, um, of uh, conflict of interest, and worst of all, of corruption. So bear in mind the importance of the court of auditors and uh, as well as the importance of OLAF. Next, please. Um, yeah, maybe I just came over this. If we can move on because I would like to give the floor. Um, uh, lately, the, uh, so the, 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 uh, the parliament, um, no, maybe we just can pass this if I may. Um, so the, the new conditionality mechanism provided under this um, regulation uh, that was adopted um, on the 16 December of 2020 is, um, is as an added value in contrast to the uh, atomic bomb procedure. The mechanism is more speedy and more effective uh, because it's focusing not on a general breach of the rule of law, but on a specific breach of some principles that are likely to jeopardize, uh, to hinder the sound financial management of the EU funds. Um, and so the, the key question that was debated uh, both by the European parliaments within the uh, commissions and uh, by the Council of Ministers, whether that um, a new procedure was not um, circumventing the atoming bomb procedure based upon Article 7, or in other words, whether Article 7 was the sole and exclusive legal vehicle for the EU institution to address the breach of the founding values underpinning the EU legal order. Of course, the uh, Swedish and the Hungarian uh, um, uh, chief of states and ministers immediately claim, well, we have been deciding when we joined the EU uh, to have only one single procedure, Article 7, and uh, one has to demonstrate that there is a, a serious uh, risk of, um, of breach. Uh, and uh, a number of standards, formal standards, uh, instructional standards to, to demonstrate in order to condemn us. And one cannot add a new procedure in order to circumvent. So it's kind of um, argument. And so they brought a case for nullification of the uh, regulation of 16 December 2020 before the Court of Justice in Luxembourg. And the key, the, the key issue that was debated by the court is whether it's possible to add a supplementary approach to the atomic bomb procedure. The answer of the Court of Justice was in the affirmative. Next slide, please. The uh, Court of Justice stressed uh, that um, the regulation aims at protecting the EU budget 
it doesn't aim at making order with respect to the application of the rule of law. Uh, there is no general sanction. Uh, there are specific sanctions regarding suspension of payments. And so the question is whether uh, the EU lawmaker was endowed with the specific competences uh, to deal with these issues. Also, the answer was in the affirmative. Uh, there is a specific provisions, uh, uh, rather technical uh, provision that allow the um, adoptions of regulations in order to establish and to implement the budget and to um, uh, present auditing accounts. And the Court of Justice has been satisfied with the legal basis chosen by the EU lawmaker, so the Council of Ministers and the Parliament. So the, um, the, the Hungarian and Polish authorities lost the case. Uh, their uh, arguments were dismissed. So in this slide, we have been highlighting the difference between Article 7 and, art and the regulation. So the, 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 the regulations really target, it's targeting a, a specific breach uh, corruption in that department, um, um, confusion of uh, a conflict of interest in that department, um, the, the fact that the organism payer uh, regarding direct payment for the farmers um, has been um, misguided in not implementing co correctly the calculation for calculating uh, the size of the fields. And that could lead to the proposal by the Commission of suspension of payments, not of everything, but of particular funds. So we, we are really dealing with the procedural legality that was mentioned uh, at the uh, beginning. Um, so uh, to conclude with, um, the Commission has been rather unsatisfied by the answers uh, put forward by the Hungarian authorities. And so when the Commission is upset, uh, <laughs> it can get really angry. And the Commission has been proposing on the 18th of September of uh, this year, a cut of 7.5 uh, million euros uh, with respect to the uh, cohesion funds. Um, on the 15th of September 2022, the European Parliament got very angry at Hungary. And, or, and in a fairly long communication, a very well-reasoned communication, a claim that Hungary was not anymore a democracy, so was breaching, uh, from uh, generally speaking, uh, the core value of democracy embedded in Article 2. Um, so the Commission proposed the Council of Ministers us to decide according to this qualified majority rule, and the um, ministers did do a deter because the Hungarians uh, government, Hungarian government is a bit concerned uh, and start to negotiate with the commission. So it's kind of a play, interplay between different actors. Um, the parliament adding insult to injury in proclaiming that Hungary is not anymore a democracy. And um, the decision, the final decision must be adopted in December. So the Commission normally at one month to decide. So it has to be decided, the file to be decided in, in October. Um, but there is a derogation providing the adoption uh, of the final decisions in December. So um, uh, everybody is in the dark uh, about uh, what was going, uh, what will be decided in December. Uh, the three main concerns are public procurement. Uh, public uh, interest um, um, foundations uh, or private foundations uh, established by uh, Hungarian authorities that are likely to uh, take advantage of the uh, new generation Europe funds, and the absence of independent and in particular effective investigation to ward off corruption, to ward off tax evasion. Um, so it's an ongoing fight. Uh, and we don't know the outcomes, but uh, from a political perspective, it occurs to us that um, we've seen that in a few years, thanks to uh, new fundings, um, really that uh, these uh, kind of general issues are being fleshed out into much more precise uh, mechanism. I give you the floor, Ivana.
Yeah, I just wanted to um, point on this second point. So this argument, we're moving from more indefinite criteria towards more legal criteria. I think that argument of um, Hungary and Poland was interesting where they said, actually the regulation itself doesn't meet the criteria of legal certainty. So basically um, there's no clarity and it, it leaves a lot of scope um, uh, in terms of uh, politicization of the concept of the rule of law. And the um, response to uh, of the Court of Justice to that was very interesting. It was dismissed by court, but what the court said was that these elements of the rule of law, first of all, have been uh, developed in the um, case law of the Court of Justice, hence they're not political, they we already know what these principles are, that they're common values of the member states, so um, that, that they're applied by the member states, so therefore they member states are actually in the position to determine when we do have a breach of a principle. And then that emphasis on the legal test, uh, really, so that there has to be a genuine link between, on the one hand, the breach um, of the principle, and on the other hand, um, the effect has to be uh, a serious risk um, uh, with respect to financial interests or uh, sound management of of the union. So, um, and of course, the 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 other important aspect, the strict procedural requirements. Again, that there has to be a consultation process with the member states. So, um, I think that's that's important to emphasize. But of course, we put the question whether this is really defeat for Hungary and Poland, in light of what what Nicholas has said, but also in light of the fact that actually regulation is limited in scope because it's not expected that we could, we will be able to actually address um, or change the adherence uh, to the rule of law of uh, member states. The objective is really to protect the budget so that um, uh, there has to be a sufficiently direct link between um, the breach of the principle of the rule of law and uh, the budget. So it's not really about, as Nicholas mentioned, uh, penalizing the breach, but protecting the budget. Yes, yes, that's really the objective pursuit. So the, uh, the court has been underscoring that time and again in its judgment. Um, that it's, it's not a copy and paste of the Article 7 procedure. It's, it's an additional procedure aiming at achieving another objective. Uh, I would like to add to um, the uh, comments uh, made by Ivana regarding legal certainty that the court also emphasized uh, that the states, um, that this principle can also uh, be fed by the um, case law of the National Constitutional Court. So the, uh, the EU legal order is also underpinned by the constitutional constitutions um, um, and by the uh, case law of the constitutional court, according to an article four, paragraph two of the Treaty of the EU. So that's important as a linkage. So the autonomy of the EU legal order does not preclude that the Court of Justice take advantage uh, of the development made by uh, at the level of the National Constitutional Court. Right, so uh, we welcome your questions or comments and <laughs> thank you. Um, yeah, hopefully we didn't lose. <laughs> uh, but... Hi, hi everyone. Can oh. I? Yeah, yes. Is that... Maybe if if Ivana, you, you Gabriel, you, you, can you, you maybe put... put your camera on? Yes. No? No. Maybe Ivana, can, can you switch off the uh, the hi. Uh, the, yes. uh, the the yes, like it's much better like this. Thanks. Hi everyone. Um, can you hear me yes, and see perfect. me? Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you very much for for this talk. Very, very informative, especially for someone like me uh, who's completely out of the field. Uh, so um, my I my my question is is a bit more general, and maybe it will sound a bit vague. Uh, 
but it's just uh, I just I'm just curious if maybe uh, um, I can I can have your like maybe more a personal opinion as uh, from you as legalists uh, on 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 uh, on the method that I want to uh, to to bring forth, and I, I'm just uh, I'm um, uh, I think um, uh, Professor Professor the uh, Sadelia uh, mentioned um, uh, that the the legal system and uh, and consequently the rule of law is of course um, underpinned by by key values that are almost not negotiable in the sense that this is as uh, it's it's is the the core of democracy the the um, the the um, the legacy of, of of the Western tradition, let's say. So it's uh, where, where of course, um, somehow you cannot really escape them, right? So, um, and you also made the, of course, the connection um, uh, to the to the ideological matrix in which this is rooted, which is, of course, as also. Um, uh, Dr. Damjanovic uh, uh, was saying is liberalism. We we call it liberalism, right? Um, so my my um, my question, let's say, would uh, is is uh, would be how how can we how how can we interpret, or at least from the, the your point of view as legalist, how can we we interpret this surge of uh, populism in in Europe, um, and this questioning, like quite almost violent questioning of of, of liberalism as a political system, um, uh, is it maybe because because it really it fails? It seems that it fails to respond effectively to the crisis of the present, or is it just some kind of uh, maybe? Uh, a nostalgic kind of uh, um, uh, consequence or um, reaction uh, of, so, and I'm referring, of course, not just to the right wing populism, uh, but also to the left wing populism that, that, at least uh, from my perspective, uh, might might add something more useful to the, <laughs> to the to how we we uh, again how we interpret our. Um, uh, Western legacy and, and, and liberalism. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyway. Okay. Can you, uh, do you wish to start? Ivana? Yeah, I think this is, this is really a very good question. Um, because yeah, we can look at liberalism as well as a political um, philosophy, not not only a legal philosophy. Of course, in in law, what we do, and especially if we look at liberalism from the perspective of classical liberalism, that idea of negative liberty, which is focused on freedoms and non-intervention of state into um, into uh, any sphere of people's life, including economy. And uh, of course, in the extreme, that can bring uh, to different problems because uh, you you actually can end up with um, with a lot of inequality in society. So the idea is to have equality, but actually um, that autonomy does not necessarily um, addresses the the inequality. So that's why we need to talk about positive liberty as well and intervention of state in terms of. Uh, policies that are addressing those uh, uh, inequalities, so uh, positive discrimination uh, as well. So I think that um, indeed the um, the um, problem of of liberalism uh, has been and perhaps reflected in that neoliberal um, philosophies uh, where we we kind of. Try, especially in economy, trying to um, remove the barriers, uh, enable uh, free trade, uh, enable investment, and uh, in that process, really, uh, there's been a lot of uh, winners and losers. And um, so the now the realization that actually we have to 
um, have a more positive action, even if you look at the issues like uh, climate change. So I think Nicholas can talk more about it uh, in terms of the intervention of courts in trying to emphasize that um, you know, climate change policies are equally important and it's not only about um, countries' obligations uh, in terms of free trade, but also countries' obligations in terms of, um, of um, uh, environmental obligations, uh, Paris Agreement and so on. So uh, I, I can see, and I think that that has been realized uh, as well at uh, within the EU, uh, if you look at the policy documents uh, with respect to um, globalization and this idea of, of a change um, uh, in terms of uh, more sustainable development and um, focus on uh, on empowering citizens. But um, uh, of course, you know, I think problem of populism is, and perhaps that's a problem of, um, you know, simplifying solutions. There are no simple solutions. And populists are there to offer or seems to be offering very easy, quick solutions. It, it just doesn't work like that in life. Life is not black and white. There's a lot of gray. Uh, so um, the, uh, the way forward is really to try to work within the system that you have rather than, um, and th this is what populism does, trying to basically demolish the system of, of rules, the system of institutions in which um, through which uh, those rules are uh, implemented. I, I will complement in brief to allow you to, to, to put forward other questions. Uh, article 2 uh, refers uh, to equality as well as to the non-discrimination between uh, men and women. Uh, so the, the concept appears two, um, twice in this uh, key um, um, in this key provision. Um, as my colleagues stress, of course, there are uh, significant differences. Um, if one look at the implementation of the common agricultural policies uh, that has been favoring the development of big farmers, and that has been quite detrimental uh, to small farmers that are particularly located in Central Europe. Um, it occurs to me that the importance of the judgment that we've just been commenting lies on the proclamation of the principle of solidarity. So solidarity is mentioned in the Treaty of the European Union, but not as a value, not as a, one of the key founding value. Uh, and the Court of Justice is stressing that this is a fundamental principle between the member states. And in um, adopting this um, uh, budgetary control mechanism, the um, uh, member states aim at protecting uh, the budgets against fraud. And that rests upon um, mutual trust. So the mutual trust between the Polish and the Belgian between the Slovakian and the French is indispensable in order to implement properly a common budget and to avoid these significant inequalities that could stem from uh, corruption or from fraud. Thank you very much, very interesting. Thank you. Um, uh, yes, thank you both for a very interesting um, an articular presentation. I have a question that is really linked about my own understanding, just to clarify that I, I got the main principle that you were, one of the main points that you were trying to make. And then I have a, maybe a bon general question um, for both of you. So am I correct to infer from all these uh, tortuous uh, routes that you presented today that we are facing a major crisis of this idea of the rule of law as a political principle that goes back to values because ultimately uh, as for every law we need uh, the power to implement it that power stems from financial regulations within the EU so that is like a contradiction in terms because something that is political in nature, such as a set of uh, core values, uh, constitutional values, uh, has, to be, has to be transformed and translated into financial measures in order to find, uh, uh, to become an instrument of, of serving justice, badly put. And, and that assumes, of course, that there is one common financial interest within the EU area, which of course we know 
blatantly not being the case. And Nicolas, you were just commenting about agricultural policies, just out of a million examples we could pick. So I was wondering whether, um, if I get this correctly, then the major issue here is that if we're facing a breach of values, uh, such as potentially in the case of Hungary and Poland, I would be inclined to say, yes, uh, we are facing that. Uh, let's see what happens in Italy. This is another interesting moment we are <laughs> confronting. But then basically until they don't, uh, like until the budget, the EU budget is protected, which is a very interesting definition. Basically these governments can get away by hurting everything else, literally in, within their scope. So, um, and this again gives us a very interesting idea of what is the economic realm we're looking at, because if there is, it operates in, in practice a very uh, problematic distinction between financial interests and uh, living practices that concern ecological or, or civil uh, rights uh, as, as, as an other from financial cycle. So um, I'd, be, I'd be very grateful if you could maybe expand a bit more on, on this line of reasoning, because I'm, I'm sure I'm very confused uh, as, as well. Um, yeah, and so the, the question that was maybe more as an opener for, uh, for uh, trying to wrap my head around this principle of the rule of law, that it still seems very interesting uh, as a way of, of, like as a starting point, for me would be, um, is there a tradition within legal studies that actually criticizes this? So in other words, are there like cases of abuses of the rule of law? Is it perhaps from an anti-colonial perspective or other kind of perspectives? Because it seems to me that it's presented in your discourses as a very positive kind of um, I, like a principle uh, that we kind of seem to uh, take for granted, but I wonder, is, it, is, it, uh, is, is that so across the board, or what are the current discussions around the rule of law in legal uh, mm. circles? Thank you very much. Do, do we should begin? Yeah, I, I can maybe start by tackling the, the last part of the question. Of course, the rule of law has been criticized, especially in critical legal theory and in, in socio-legal studies. So. Um, legal sociology has actually um, looked at different ways in which the rule of law has failed in terms of uh, living to these ideals of liberalism, of equality uh, and, uh, and rights. So yeah, if you look at feminist uh, legal theory, uh, you will see a lot, uh, a lot of, of course, there are liberal feminists who would say we still have, you know, liberalism still works uh, fine, but there are things that we need to improve. Of course, radical feminists will say, well, actually, there is a problem with the whole nature of the legal system, and, um, and uh, we have to change that from the root. Um, and you know, cultural feminists looking more at how um, legal system has been changing from that idea of yeah adversarial system in particular in the west where you have this competition between the winner and the loser in the in the um court towards more um the idea that law is becoming uh, more about compromise so we move from that um system of uh, adversarial system towards more um uh, mediation uh, a system where we try to find solutions that work for everyone that we avoid that so you have different uh, analysis there in particular yeah you mentioned decolonization and um, there is a lot of um, recognition of how law has actually served to um, to uh, to create injustice in particular in Australia we talk a lot about the role of law in terms of uh, First Nations people. So um, uh, where was basically law um, used to uh, uh, used uh, used against uh, the Aboriginal people? First, not recognized in them at all as relevant legal subjects to then being used as as a tool of discrimination and um, and oppression. Indeed, oppression even more than 
just discrimination. So there's a lot of uh, talk about the rule of law and recognition. What I think we try to emphasize here is that um, the way that lawyers try to avoid political aspects of the rule of law is through focusing on the method where, you know, method becomes objective. And uh, of course, there's a lot of move from that idea of equality towards the idea of equity. So how do we achieve actually substantive justice? Because this formal justice, which is expressed in the rule of law, has pretty much different um, effects and a lot of uh, issues. And you know, you can look at it also from the perspective of the access to justice. So, um, you know, to what extent your financial means determine your ability to actually implement uh, laws. And so th the whole idea that, you know, law gives power is uh, uh, becomes irrelevant if you actually don't have means through which you're going to implement those rules. So there's really a lot of scholarship uh, looking at that. I think what was in particular with this um, regulation, I, I think it was a way to also find a, a political compromise um, between uh, the institutions. Of course, the parliament wanted to have something very different, something which will be able to actually um, penalize the member states for the breaches of the rule of law. This ended up more to be a compromise saying, okay, let's find that financial interest, the budget, which is supposed to be a common good that we're going to protect then uh, by enforcing the rule of law. But um, yeah, Nicholas. Yes. Um, just uh, wish also to, to come back to the comments of uh, made by uh, Gabriel Serbu. Um, it seems to me that the, Although our speech might sound a bit technical because we, we, we address uh, technical issues, uh, in particular as consultant, I do address these technical issues constantly. Uh, the, the fact of um, uh, fighting fraud and corruption makes sense because if that's not done, it's just compounding the mistrust among lay persons. It just compound the anti-liberal movement we discussed a few minutes ago. The government is corrupt all in all. We have no say as citizens, as taxpayers. And so it's, we, we need to reverse this uh, extremely simplistic discourse um, heaping scorn upon the EU institution, upon the national uh, institutions, and then just look at the figures. And so I, um, I'm just looking at the uh, report 14th of 2022 of the um, uh, Court of Auditors based in Luxembourg. Uh, so one believes that uh, the common agricultural policy is really prone to fraud. Apparently, according to the auditors, uh, the fraud represents only 0.09% of the uh, 53 billion yearly uh, euros uh, spent within that policy, 0.09 persons. So the, the, the fraud is taking place um, more uh, within the spending of the funds of the regional funds, of the federal funds, which are also of importance uh, to your country. Um, yes, yeah, so I, I think it's uh, important to call a spade a spade. Well, you could also argue, Nicolas, to what extent that uh, enforcement has been successful. So, and uh, whether there is more fraud that hasn't been caught by the yes. institutions. Yes, but uh, one has to accept that uh, the uh, EU constructions is, um, uh, is still at the level of industrial organization. It's reckoning upon the due diligence placed upon the state authority. So the, the, the case law of the Court of Justice uh, regarding uh, the fight against fraud is very clear. The um, um, member states uh, must um, 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 carry out the missions of surveillance control and they need to uh, uh, recuperate uh, the, the, the money that has been frauded. So the specific obligation placed upon the state. So, so we, we are dealing with a complex uh, institutional structures with the court of auditors, uh, with the uh, organism payer at, at the national state level and uh, this 
uh, organism has to be accredited by independent bodies. So the, 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 the structure makes sense in a, in a system that's placed under the concept of subsidiarity. If I may, thank you very much, uh, Nicholas and Ivana. Um, it was uh, uh, probably uh, from point of view of the expertise, uh, you, you uh, uh, have much more to say, but as you said, you, we, we are uh, here coming from different disciplines and uh, have also that common sense that guides us whenever we hear things like that. And for me, this is all that is a positive law and this is beautiful thing. And this is the construction of what is among us uh, humanists, uh, the, the best of value of it. But we are facing uh, the atrocities, not only the war uh, at the moment in Europe, but also um, um, very un definite, uh, through definite criteria, uh, changes uh, in political, institutional uh, crisis, cultural uh, discrepancies, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, uh, the construction of the rule of law, as I said, is a humanist construction. It's, it's uh, enlightenment, it's bringing through education, through influencing all of us, but we are facing the, 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 the current uh, alt-right, authoritarian, all these changes that are so dangerous and institutionally speaking, uh, what is there so that we can resist? USA uh, faced a huge breach into uh, the uh, uh, all forms uh, and still is facing it in, in elections. They will pay for, for all that has been happening with Trump. Mm -hmm. uh, what I would like to ask you now and you said about the Hungary and about the uh, Poland facing like how, what are the, the, the processes of negotiation and power relation where you can impose not only through the mechanisms that you already have, but that you need to impose uh, the rule of law mm -hmm. in between lines, in between all these institutional measures that you uh, uh, described. Yes. Because behind mm. the, 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 any institution, there is a bunch of people, individuals, important individuals, less important individuals, all forms of biases, uh, and uh, a chaos. We have a, a, a fellow here in, in Center for Advanced Studies and I'm, unfortunately she, she was unable to join us, but she's working on transnational, transnational kleptocracy and uh, uh, global financial architecture. And then of course, uh, uh, more into transnational authoritarianism and uh, uh, the, the, the intersection between governance and, and geopolitics. So uh, I, I imagine uh, having a, a, a dialogue on that as well, bringing you from, from uh, legal studies, then Valeria from, from cultural studies as well, or Athena Prelitz, that's her name, from, from international relations and uh, imagining a, a, a place where we can uh, face it. We know the danger, we named it, we see what is going on, at least uh, from outside. But what next? What is next to be done? Um, yes. Um, may, may, may I start? 
Yes, Even please. Um, it, it occurs to me that law, uh, for a number of reasons that were explained by my colleague, must be formalistic. So law is abstract. Um, I cannot um, endorse, uh, law, lawyers cannot uh, endorse a, a subjective approach. Um, a second um, food for thought is that when Article 7 was um, um, written, uh, negotiated by the masters of the treaties, uh, they had in mind uh, a coup d'etat, um, uh, because it's uh, all provisions. And so they did not consider a slow uh, deterioration of liberal democracy. I imagine the, 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 the were Western lawyers um, really embedded in this uh, um, liberal uh, trend. And they could, they, they, they were convinced that uh, beat Poland, um, uh, beat uh, Hungary, beat Slovakia, uh, democracy would have been uh, would have been accepted uh, in its own right, and um, so the the, 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 the the there was no vision of uh, other phenomena uh, in the course of the uh, early two thousands. So that explains why uh, this Article Seven mechanism is uh, ill suited um, to condemn a state. Um, for redeparting from democracy. And the only legal way, constitutional, consistent way to move uh, through uh, is to um, adopt a much more technical mechanism that are uh, targeted to specific behavior, but that cannot lead to a full condemnation um, um, that must be decided at higher political level. Yeah. Yeah, I think that that was a very good uh, comment and question. And I think we we also have to recognize yeah, the limitations of law. And I think this is um, one of the things that law is there to pro provide a structure through which we work. But as we can see, even from what Nicholas was explaining in terms of trying to even enforce this. So we, we acknowledge that this financial regulation is already a political compromise. And now we are getting to a situation where it becomes politically difficult to even implement debt, something that we have already put into defined legal terms, as the court has said, we're facing the, the political um, uh, stumbling block. So um, the question is really how to, uh, I, I still believe that we need to have structures and the, the problem that, um, we are seeing like with Trump, with, you know, the war in, uh, in Ukraine, it's constantly the, 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 the things, the thing is about destroying those structures so that you, you actually work against the rule of law of how do we concentrate that power in the hands of, of one person. And that, that's been the problem also in, in Hungary. I mean, Poland the problem is when you start to attack courts because uh, without independent courts, then who is going to control the executive? So we, we still need to work on having those institutions, but of course it's, uh, it, it goes much beyond law. And I think within the EU, uh, it's, it's also a, a lot of political compromise where mm -hmm. you, know, you have to yeah. put pressure on, on, on those um, states, yes. Uh, yes, I remind uh, six, seven years ago, I, I follow the uh, Eurozone crisis, and uh, there are also a uh, mechanism uh, in order to condemn states that reaching uh, the three percent deficit rule and the sixty percent uh, budgetary rule, so ex extremely complicated, and so uh, the, the procedure was uh, proposed by the Commission, adopted by the Council and the Parliament, and it's very favorable to the to the European Commission, uh, extremely favorable, but it led finally to political compromise, and and maybe the result was not too bad at the end of the day, because later on, you know, that all the, the, the rules, uh, the six, the three person and 60 persons uh, threshold were suspended in the course of the uh, COVID crisis. Um, and um, so there was no hard sanction decided. Um, so there, there was kind of political compromise. But at the end of the day, um, my state, Belgium, uh, succeeded in um, taking this budgetary obligation much more seriously. Um, so the, the fact of triggering the procedure 
these technical procedures, uh, be it with the Eurozone, be it with the budget, uh, could um, lead uh, to, um, I would say, more uh, beneficial solutions than uh, to get into full conflicts. And that's perhaps what we look at uh, uh, with the, uh, the, the, the conflict between the European Parliament, the European Commission and Hungary as well as uh, Belgium has so also a conflict, a, a serious conflict with Hungary nowadays, um, that maybe at the end of the day, uh, the uh, Hungarian authorities will add much water into their wine. I think there is a question. May I? Um, yeah, um, so first of all, thank you very much for this very interesting presentation. Um, my question is, is a normative one. So um, uh, I have, a, I have a, a colleague from the Netherlands, Tom Tens, who, who this year published an article where he basically argues for, for the EU having the right and the mechanism to expel anti-democratic uh, member states because you see a, um, a normative contradiction between uh, two aims here of, of, um, of article 7 and 2 is that uh, it would be anti-democratic uh, to allow uh, um, uh, authoritarian member states to, to influence um, EU, EU decision and the EU law. Um, on the other hand, he also has this view that it would be anti-democratic not to allow them, for example, uh, uh, exercising their, their uh, political rights within the EU. So, um, so there, this suggests that if, of course, if not simply just to, to expel them, that at least the mechanism should exist within, uh, within the structure of, of, of EU law. So what, what, what do you think about that? Yeah, you're, you're welcome to answer, Ivana. Yeah, I think, um, I, I, I think that a financial regulation, indeed, if we look at it, I, I think if, you know, the question whether it's defeat for Hungary and Poland, I truly believe it's it's not. If I look at the regulation and I don't think that the regulation goes far enough in uh, in addressing the the problems that we have with Hungary and Poland. There, There's no doubt about that. I would be, yeah, expelling member states, I think that I always believe that you can have more influence if you have people around the table, if you don't, rather than if you don't have them at all. I, I do believe in that um, there has to be um, a platform for uh, cooperation. Um, and in that sense, um, I think it's important to, to have them in, but to have more pressure on them. And I think Nicholas wants to Yes. wants to add something. Uh, uh, I don't think that the regulation as it is goes far enough in terms of, of, yeah. of addressing. Yeah, a few, a few days uh, I had a chance to look at the um, pre preliminary work of the constitu constitution because the Treaty of Lisbon is the upshot of the failed constitution. And um, uh, the negotiators, uh, they were MPs, uh, chief of governments, ministers, academics, they clearly dismissed the idea of expelling a member state. So the, at the end of the day, the, the maximal sanction that can be decided is to uh, suppress uh, or to suspend, to suspend, sorry, to suspend the votes to write within the council. So the, uh, it means that Hungary cannot uh, vote um, uh, a directive on the internal market, a regulation on anti-dumping regulations. Uh, so that's that's really um, important. That's a political choice. So, um, yes, that's it. Yeah, I, I, that's perfectly fine. And I, I, I don't even know what I think about this option. So it's like I, I don't want to. I don't want to suggest. But um, it's and I fully understand, Nicholas, that uh, um, the EU member states wouldn't want to do that. But it's it, that doesn't solve the normative problem. 
and and sorry and just to uh, just to answer to Ivana uh, as well so um, well conversations and negotiations and um, and um, you know uh, um, all such things can happen within uh, EU and non-EU members uh, or non-EU states so basically that wouldn't be of course uh, uh, the, uh, um, a decision forever. So basically, there could be mechanisms to uh, to get those states back after a while. If they, for example, if they really do, and this is uh, um, um, connects to Valeria's point, if they really do some real change regarding, uh, 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 you know, the, 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 this um, authoritarian nature of of, of how how uh, politics is organized in in mentioned states. Um, but sorry, Nicholas, you, you wanted to yeah, yes. That was the, the second argument I would like to put forward uh, in, in reading between the lines of uh, different comments in French, um, uh, not from uh, English speaking authors. Um, the uh, underlying idea is to, to sanction to severely a member states will be to sanction the Polish undertakings. It will be to sanction to deprive the Polish undertakings and the Polish citizen from the rights uh, they are stemming from the internal market. And so the, the idea is really to strike a balance to condemn the, the, the state authorities for departing from the principle, for bre breaching the principles of the rule of law or the principles of democracy without condemning um, the citizens um, uh, from the acquis communautaire. Thank you. Yeah, I think what is interesting is, you know, why do we even come to the issue of contestation of norms? You know, what understanding those underlying reasons, why do states like Hungary and Poland contest the EU norms and values? And I think that's that really is uh, because the EU has worked for them. Um, very well. So um, the question of the causes is very interesting. I don't think that law can resolve that question. Um, we need to look at that from, from the perspectives of different disciplines. But again, the, the role of law is, it is uh, also to provide those frameworks through which that. Yes. Um maybe um, not from a legal perspective but, but from a policy perspective um, I would like to, to reflect upon the, the the feeling I shared among the ministers of uh, my federal government uh, in a nutshell they are angry uh, at Poland and at Hungary on the account that they are the main recipients of the federal fund and the um, uh, rural development fund and the um, uh, FIOGA funds and they seem to depart from the basic value. So uh, the, the Belgian authorities uh, believe that there can be some room of, for adaptation so that the constitution um, of Romania can uh, preclude the marriage of uh, sex people. So th that's not a problem from the Belgian perspective, but the, the, the fact to, to have the cake, uh, um, how this thing goes, even, uh, the, 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 the <laughs> Have the cake and eat it. <laughs> yes, I'm too much in France now. <laughs> have the cake in a uh, typical uh, English expression and uh, saying, and uh, so you, you cannot get uh, the big chunk um, to grab the, the, the lion's share of the funds and, and then to um, to say, okay, uh, bash, bash Brussels, uh, pour, uh, pour scorn upon Brussels. That's a bit too much. And I, I think that's the... Uh, that's the that will be a view shared by my prime ministers by the the by the, the vice prime ministers of my federal government thank thank you well uh thank you everyone this has been an incredible conversation very rich uh, unless um, there are any other pressing questions or, or feedback I would maybe uh, being a bit wary of time uh, begin to thank uh, our guests Ivana and Nicolas thank you very much and um, I will um, I hope this will continue in some other uh, way offline or online in various circumstances 
uh, across uh, our intricate globe. And uh, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, the uh, recordings from today will be available on YouTube very shortly from the channel of the, of the center. So if anybody wants to revisit some of the exchanges, uh, the materials will be there. Okay, um, have a lovely afternoon, everyone, or evening for you, Ivan. <laughs> Thanks Bye. a lot. It's been a pleasure and really nice to meet you and um, to, to have this exchange. So I uh, hope to we continue some other time. Yes, yes, and uh, it was uh, great to, to share uh, our analysis uh, with you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.